Somehow, the idea had taken hold that one day soon, man would be able to travel to the moon. Well, maybe not real soon. Germany underwent a rocket craze in the 1920s, but behind the scenes, there was very serious work going on in an academic and engineering sense by people who really thought that we had a future based around rocket flight. These pioneering scientists plan to develop all manner of rockets, planes, and spaceships. Their vision included space travel to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. Space stations from which they could control Earth's climate and rocket planes that could carry passengers around the Earth in around a couple of hours. Their sole purpose was the exploration of space. They were not expecting to see their revolutionary ideas used as weapons of war. But the Nazis saw other possibilities. They were quick to realize that rockets had military potential and offered limitless opportunities for a country bent on world domination. German army generals like Walter Dornberger kept a close eye on the work of the amateur rocketeers. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, Dornberger hoped that by exploiting the genius of this exciting new generation of scientists and engineers, the German army would be able to develop powerful and extraordinary new weapons. He cherry-picked some of the best brains. Top of the list was Werner von Braun. Dornberger installed him at a new top-secret rocket research center at Pinemunde on Germany's Baltic coast. Von Braun set to work. With limitless funds, Von Braun built rocket after rocket, not to travel to the moon, but to develop the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile. Meanwhile, the man widely regarded as the founding father of German rocketry, Hermann Obert, had even more ambitious and fantastic ideas. Obert believed that it was possible to colonize space. He proposed an orbiting space station. He also planned to fire a giant mirror into space to reflect great beams of sunlight onto dark parts of the Earth. Originally, these were ideas of peace, but now he offered them as weapons to aid the Nazi war effort. He had a, almost like a dual personality, and one, one side of it, in addition to be a pacifist, he was a warrior. He also said, my space mirror could also be used for military purposes. I could burn up ships at sea. I could, I could, I could focus my space mirror on troop concentrations and, and destroy them. I, I could focus in on cities and burn whole, large holes in places like London or New York City. But Obert's ideas were far in advance of their time. Although he worked for the Nazis at Penimunda, his space wheel and mirror were seen as wonder weapons for the future, when the Nazis had won the war on Earth. But by 1943, thoughts of world domination were receding fast. The war was changing course. Wave upon wave of American B-17 bombers were decimating German cities. Privately, many German leaders were beginning to fear that this was a war they could not win. Among them, Hermann Göring, head of the German Luftwaffe. Hermann Göring realized by 1943 that there was a definite possibility that Germany would lose this war. The, the American mass production of B-17 bombers was overwhelming. If something was not done to hit the sources of mass production, Germany would in fact lose the war. So now, Göring turned to the rocket engineers for inspiration. A brilliant scientist called Eugen Sanger had an idea for a plane that could travel through space. If you want an example of looking really into the future, then look at the amazing designs of Eugen Sanger. This man had a plan for what he called an antipodal bomber. It could fly to the Antipodes, the other side of the world. Sanger's space bomber was decades ahead of its time. At 
At takeoff, the plane was to be propelled along a monorail by a sled fired by V-2 rockets. After 1.7 miles, the plane would be traveling at over 1,000 miles an hour. As it left the track, a second rocket inside the bomber would alter the plane's trajectory and propel it 90 miles into space. The point about Eugen Sanger's design was that you'd in essence put the plane into an orbit. So you'd burn a lot of fuel to get it up there, but once it was on the fringe of space, it could then act more or less as a glider. It could then come back and intersect with the upper layers of the atmosphere and then use them like a pebble skipping on a, on a lake. A pilot would fly the plane along the edge of the Earth's atmosphere, traveling at 13,500 miles an hour it would circuit the Earth in two hours. It could drop its lethal payload on any city in the world. Although the Germans had no nuclear bomb capability, they planned to use a bomb that would spread radioactive particles into the atmosphere. The bomb carried by the Sanger bomber would have, would have been a 5,000 pound high explosive bomb wrapped with blankets of radioactive silica. The device would be dropped at about 2,000 feet, 3,000 feet above the city, it would explode. The radioactive silica would fall like snowflakes. And the end result would be uh, radioactive sickness and death. Having dropped its deadly payload, the space bomber would glide back to Germany, gradually re-entering Earth's atmosphere. The landing part, where it's in essence gliding down to Earth without any power, is very much like the shuttle. The difference between the antipodal bomber and the modern shuttle is that the shuttle doesn't have engines, and the antipodal bomber did. This was clearly a revolutionary weapon, which really could change the course of the war. Goering immediately set Sanger up in his own research base in northern Germany with instructions to develop the anti-polar bomber. But Sanger had a secret. He knew perfectly well that his idea would be years in the making. But desperate for the funding, he omitted to tell Goering about the timescale. He even persuaded Nazi leaders that the anti-polar bomber could be a useful propaganda tool for them. The Nazis were delighted because they had a, a new piece of armory in their propaganda machine. Eugen Sanger was delighted because somebody was paying him to indulge his favorite hobby. When Hermann Göring finally realized the antipolar bomber was an idea that was simply too far ahead of its time, his mood abruptly changed. Sanger, I think, was largely lucky to avoid simply being thrown into some sort of camp or prison for what was increasingly seen by the Germans as a waste of their wartime resources and money. After the war, Sanger's report on his anti polo bomber was carefully analyzed by the victorious Allies. Some of its features, like the system of re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, can be seen in today's space shuttle. there is one crucial difference. The main difference, of course, is that the space shuttle is carried aloft on a rocket, whereas Eugen Sanger's uh, antipodal bomber would have got there under its own steam. In fact, of course, it wouldn't have worked. You would need a multi-stage rocket to get something like that bomber up into near-Earth orbit. It is impossible to put a heavy plane of that sort up into near orbit simply by carrying its own fuel. Nazi inventiveness and ambition knew no limits. Backed by outstanding engineers, they would produce many fantastic weird weapons of destruction that worked brilliantly, like a gun that could shoot round corners. Throughout history, German technology consistently produced guns of superb quality. Not only were they bigger and better than anyone else's, they were more simply engineered and more efficiently produced. 
One of the best was the MP44, the world's first assault rifle. The thing that makes this weapon really unique in 1944 is the fact that it's both semi-automatic and fully automatic. And by semi-automatic, I mean every time you pull the trigger back one pressure, it fires one round. But you can put this thing into full automatic fire, and when you do that thing, when you pull back the trigger, it will continue to fire until the magazine is empty. No one had a gun to compare to this. Standard issue for Allied troops was either a rifle or a submachine gun. Both were at a disadvantage against the assault rifle. Then, German engineers went one better. They came up with a thing called the curved barrel device. And here it is, it's a way to shoot around corners. And what this is, this is a very, very heavy piece of metal that was stuck on the end of the barrel. And as the bullet came down here and hit this, it was turned 90 degrees and exited here. The curved barrel was developed because of a rare engineering error on a tank assembly line. Engineers found they had built tanks which could not be fitted with the normal turrets. Ever resourceful, they gave the vehicle flat roof and a new name, an elephant. They fitted it with an 88 millimeter gun to use as a long range weapon against Russian tanks on the Eastern Front. But in their haste, someone forgot to fit a machine gun, leaving the elephant fatally exposed to attack. Russian infantry learned real quick that they could run up to these vehicles, pour gasoline on the top, and torch the vehicle. And the vehicles could not support each other. You don't have a machine gun aboard the vehicle. So if you're here and I'm here, Russian infantry is climbing on your vehicle. I have no way with a machine gun to keep them off. A weapon was needed to help the German crews to defend themselves inside the elephants. So the modified M MP44 with this curved barrel device was created so that the German crew could stick this outside the turret and hose the vehicle down to keep Russian infantry from climbing on the vehicle. Engineers experimented with two models. One curved 30 degrees the other by 90. The sharper angle was for use in confined spaces like tanks. Having made a gun that could shoot round corners, now German troops wanted to see who they were firing at. You'll notice that it has a, an area here that's sort of cut away and it's rough. And what the Germans installed there was a mirror so that they had the sight back here and they could look around the corner to see what they were shooting at. There was one more small problem. The curved barrel tended to distort and shatter bullets as they were fired. But even that turned out to be an advantage for soldiers fighting at close quarters. As the bullet's traveling around the barrel, the bullet is going to heat up tremendously and basically is going to fly apart. So what you're going to get is a shotgun effect coming out of the, the muzzle of the weapon. But remember, you're fighting at very, very close ranges, so that doesn't really matter. With or without the curved barrel, the MP44 seemed to have everything. Yet strangely, there was one man in Germany who didn't like it, Adolf Hitler. When he was first shown this thing, he hated it because it was made out of stampings and it, was, it looked ugly to him. So he said, don't produce it. Well, the German army did it anyway. They defied him, which was not a good thing to do if you were a German general. Well, they got away with it because this was such a good weapon. German engineers set the highest standards of innovative gun design. But in 1944, as the war was slipping away, they began to experiment with ever more bizarre weapons. Guns that astonishingly didn't fire bullets or shells, but instead used elements of nature as ammunition. These weapons were the brainchild of Albert Speer, Hitler's armaments minister. He set up research bases in Germany and Austria to develop them. This was one. It may look like two giant loudspeakers, but in fact it was a sound gun designed to kill. The gun worked by igniting a mixture of methane and oxygen in a resonant chamber. This created a chain of explosions up to 1500 a second, which set out a powerful and focused beam of sound. 
which was amplified by parabolic reflectors. The pressure of the sound was unendurable. It was the same as being plunged 30 feet beneath the sea in terms of pressure, and yet that pressure being reversed hundreds of times every second. It was a, a vibrating sound which could, could penetrate the human body, and the idea was you could disrupt the brain, uh, disrupt your heart. German records estimated that the sound gun would take half a minute to kill a man standing within 100 yards and seriously injure anyone within 300 yards. The sound gun may have been lethal, but it was also big and cumbersome. It was never used in battle. But I'm sure those practical problems could have been overcome. And somewhere in the world, I'll bet there's a crazed dictator who's longing to revive the idea. As well as using sound as a weapon, Nazi engineers conducted tests with guns that fired air. And the idea was that inside it you'd fuel it with hydrogen and oxygen, which would cause a tremendous explosion, and out would come a plug of air, an invisible plug of compressed air that could bring down an aircraft flying above. The wind gun was used just once when the Nazis tried unsuccessfully to defend a bridge on the Elbe River. No planes were shot down and the weapon was abandoned. None of these extraordinary weapons survive today. But in California, an entertainment group have painstakingly recreated some weird Nazi guns from World War II for their mechanization display. The idea is to give audiences a feel for what it was like in war. To feel a concussion or something like that hitting you and, and the fire and the explosions and uh, the, the smell of diesel and, and, you know, dirt being kicked up and all that is, is the closest, you know, that you're ever going to get to actually being in a battle without being there. In this show, the guns are harmless. They make a lot of noise and bring down model houses. But they were built using the same principles as the Nazis over 60 years ago. Of course, the original designs were the, the designs that the Germans made in World War II. They're the people, they're the granddaddies of all of this kind of work with uh, vortex guns and sound weapons and things like that. This is a scaled down vortex gun or cannon. The original German version was around 20 times bigger. The German gun was designed to create a vortex or whirlwind strong enough to rip their wings from an aircraft. <clears throat> this cannon, although much smaller, works on similar principles. An explosive charge is placed inside the cannon. Upon ignition, an invisible vortex is fired into the air at 100 miles an hour. Well, this one is harmless enough. It makes a lot of noise and can shatter a pane of glass. It did? Huh. But the Germans not only had a much bigger gun, they added a special ingredient, powdered coal dust, which, when mixed with the exploding vortex, made it far more powerful. It was known for centuries that powders in air will explode. Flour in a flour mill can suddenly explode. Coal dust, coal powder, in a mine can suddenly explode. And it was an Austrian invention during the war to try and harness this process to create a vortex gun. The reaction of the coal dust with air made the vortex bigger and bigger until it became the size of a small whirlwind. The dust would continue burning, fueling the spiral as it goes, and in theory at least, setting off an enormous great whirlwind that was enough to bring down a plane. Like the sound gun and the wind gun, the vortex gun never quite made it on the battlefield. The idea was truly extraordinary, but could it have worked? Could it have ever brought down a plane? If the planes had cooperated, yeah. I mean, from what they knew and what they were able to do, it's pretty amazing that they, they built these things and, and they got the effects they did out of them. But uh, I think from a practical standpoint, it's, it would have been a lucky shot, the proverbial lucky shot. But other ideas for weird weapons were far more successful. 
Early in the war, the Nazis were harnessing nature in a quite different way. Developing tanks that could travel under the sea and giant machines to fly the men and machinery they needed to invade England. June 1940. In just a few short months, the German army had conquered most of Europe. While Hitler was sightseeing in Paris, his air force, the Luftwaffe, had orders to soften up the British to pave the way for a German invasion. The success of the German army was based on blitzkrieg tactics. The sheer speed and surprise of the ferocious attacks left defenders helpless. Britain posed a new challenge, though. Hitler had to figure out a way of launching a surprise attack across the 26 miles of the English Channel. He wanted to get an invasion force of 160,000 men with heavy armor onto the shores of England, fast and with maximum shock. Germany had invested heavily in assault gliders in the 1930s, and these were used very successfully in 1940 during the invasion across the Low Countries. But these were all very small gliders capable of carrying at most 10 or 15 or perhaps 20 troops. Hitler asked the Messerschmitt factory to come up with a design for something much bigger. Amazingly, within 14 days, they produced drawings for the largest glider in history. It would carry nearly 10 times more than any other German glider. Hitler wanted it immediately. He planned to invade England in weeks. Messerschmitt knew they had to build it fast. Construction began on June 11, 1940. Prisoners of war were ordered to help. Local factories were enlisted to provide materials. The aircraft was called a Gigant, and it was an astonishing size. The wingspan was 180 feet, and its fuselage would be nearly 100 feet in length. To keep the airframe light, technicians developed a unique formula of wood and steel. The main structure comprised hollow steel tubing fortified by ribs, 22 on each wing. They were shaped and supplied by a local furniture factory. A bed factory produced the steel frame for the massive loading doors at the front of the plane. Hitler had asked for a plane that could fly a tank through the air. Messerschmitt built something even bigger. The new glider could hold 120 fully equipped troops. In all, it could carry a load of 24 tons. Incredibly, just three sheets of reinforced plywood would take the weight. Plywood, where you stick together sheets of wood with the grain at opposite directions, is much stronger than normal wood is. And if you impregnate it, soak it with resin or with some sort of varnish, then it becomes much, much stronger. The next big challenge was to get the gigant into the air. Meanwhile, another weird idea was being developed for the seabed. A key element of Hitler's invasion plans was tanks. To keep the element of surprise and get them into the battle quickly, why not drive them ashore, underwater? From July 1940, 168 Tauchpanzers were modified so they could operate below the surface of the sea. They were sealed up and snorkels were fitted to provide air for the crew. They were called dipping, or deep wading, tanks. The main problem of a deep wading tank that's actually all the way underwater and simply using a snorkel is that they're still somewhat buoyant. It might seem strange that a 25-ton steel object is buoyant, but it still has air in it. And as a result, it doesn't have good traction underwater. Tests were carried out at Putlos on the Baltic coast. They found that the tanks often became bogged down on soft soil like a riverbed. For the crews trapped 45 feet underwater, escape was a terrifying ordeal. The hatches basically have all of the weight of the water on top of them. So basically you have to let the tank fill with water. You can then open up the hatch and escape using an aqualung or something similar. But the problem is for the five or six minutes that it's taking to fill with water, it's pretty terrifying. While tank crews were learning how to escape from a tank stuck underwater, Messerschmitt's engineers were puzzling how to get the biggest glider on Earth 
into the air. An ordinary sized glider was towed by another aircraft. But for the Gigant, there was no available plane that was big enough. Rockets were attached to the wing to give more lifted takeoff, but it wasn't enough. Next, they harnessed it to three separate aircraft to pull this monster into the air. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. To coordinate three of them was impossibly difficult. They had endless crashes and near crashes, and it became obvious that using three separate aircraft to tow just one was never going to work reliably. The next idea was simply bizarre. Take two planes, cut them in half, add an extra engine, and fuse them back together. It was called a Heinkel 111Z, and although it looked decidedly odd, it worked. Eventually, someone had the bright idea of fitting the glider with its own engines. Six French Gnome Rhone Butte engines turned the Gigant from the world's largest glider into the world's greatest transport plane. It would make more noise, but it would do the job. The underwater tanks and giant gliders were strange ideas but both were available to spearhead the invasion of Britain. But determined resistance from the British Air Force persuaded Hitler to think again. In September 1940, the invasion of Britain was cancelled. But the flying gigant and the dipping tanks played their part when Hitler came to invade Russia in 1941. As the course of war swung back and forth, the German war machine came up with ever more inventive ideas. In 1944, the Nazis, using amazing new vertical takeoff planes, hit back at U.S. bombers who were decimating German cities. At the outset of World War II, Germany had the finest air force in the world. The Junkers 88 bomber and the Messerschmitt 109 fighter were a match for any aircraft in the world. In 1940, Air Force Commander Goering and Adolf Hitler were so confident of the invulnerability of the German Air Force, they put a brake on aircraft development and research. They just didn't think they'd need it. It was a decision that would have dire consequences for Nazi Germany, because by 1944, Aircraft like the ME-109 were practically obsolete. They were no match for the new U.S. fighters like the Mustang. As a result, U.S. bombers enjoyed almost complete protection as they relentlessly pounded German targets. Hermann Goering and the German Air Force were desperate for a fantastic new aircraft that just might tilt the balance of the war back in Germany's favor. They were prepared to pay any price to get it. If you look at the list of Nazi developments as the war went on, the one thing that does strike you is how profligate they were in wasting money. And there's no other way of looking at it. I mean, they weren't developing an ideal fighter and making it bigger and better and faster. They were developing dozens of them. By 1944, the German Air Ministry needed a miracle. They hoped that the many ideas that the aircraft designers were now working on would help them to fight back. One urgent requirement was for a defense interceptor that could be inexpensively mass-produced. There were many suggestions. One was called the Natter. It was a small piloted jet rocket. Using cheap wood, it could be easily built in small workshops by semi-skilled laborers. Launched from a vertical pole, it was designed to fly at 600 miles an hour. This was a small one-manned rocket that took off vertically at high speed, roared up into the upper regions of the atmosphere, and then the engine cut out. Then the pilot used it as a glider to attack aircraft as he very gently descended towards the Earth. The Natter's firepower was awesome. It had 24 air-to-air -air rockets to fire from its nose. 
But if that failed, the pilots were encouraged to bail out and ram the plane itself into enemy aircraft. The Natter itself was considered quite expendable. If the falling plane didn't strike an Allied aircraft, it would be left to crash to Earth. Only the engine would be recovered for future use. The design was considered so weird and dangerous that the German Air Ministry rejected it. But the designer, Eric Bockham, bypassed the conventional route. He persuaded Heinrich Himmler, leader of the SS, to fund the program. Despite Himmler's backing, it flew only once and crashed shortly after takeoff, killing the test pilot, Lothar Siebert. On the weird scale, the Natter comes near the top. It may not be the chart topper, but it can't be far from it. Almost as weird was another rocket-fired interceptor, this one from Messerschmitt, the ME-163. The plane took off normally, but was then blasted by a rocket vertically into the air at 600 miles an hour. This was an unheard of idea. It was powered with a proper rocket engine, and the idea was that it was launched on a set of trolley wheels that could fall away as it took off, so it didn't have the bother and the aerodynamic encumbrance of actually carrying its own undercarriage. Then it would use its rocket power to fly up to 20, 30,000 feet and then glide down shooting aircraft out of the sky as it came. The fact that it launched vertically, like a little space rocket, gave it a great advantage. It must have been hell to sit in, though, from the pilot's point of view. Of the pilots who died in the 163, just 5% were killed in combat. The rest lost their lives just trying to make it work. But where on the scale of weird does the Messerschmitt 163 rate? Well, not half as high up the scale as the Natter did. It was a success. It did work, but it was pretty crazy nonetheless. Allied bombers were so successful at targeting airfields that Germany was running out of runways. Hermann Göring realized that he needed a different kind of flying machine, one that could be hidden in the woods, hidden in the backyard, hidden anywhere, that could take off vertically, make a transition to horizontal flight, come back after its mission of attacking the B-17 bombers, make a transition and land vertically. It did not need a runway. Astonishingly, Göring turned to a zoology professor from Gottingham University, Eric von Holz, for a solution. Von Holz was an eccentric professor with a lifelong passion for dragonflies and hummingbirds. He was fascinated with the way they flew, particularly how they took off vertically and flew horizontally. He believed it might be possible to apply these principles of nature to a man-made flying machine. Using paper and rubber bands, he designed and built models that replicated the flight characteristics of the dragonfly. His paper, D. Triebflugel, The Powered Wing, proposed a vertical takeoff plane. Such a design was long sought after in the aviation world, and Funke Wolf, the aircraft engineering company, and many others, thought it might work. To Hermann Göring in 1944, it looked like a perfect solution. The tree flugel would have stood 30 foot high. Its fuselage would be surrounded by three 30 foot long rotors. At each tip would be a two foot ramjet engine. When ignited, the ramjets would lift the machine off the ground. Once airborne, it would turn gradually until it was in a high-speed horizontal flight. The Triebflugel would then be in position to attack. It would rise up to their flying altitude of, say, 28,000 feet and meet them head-on and fly through the entire bomber pack, hoping to destroy bombers or perhaps to disable bombers, and then later on, uh, Messerschmitt BF-109s and Focke-Wulf 190s could finish them off. To land, the Triebflugel would return to vertical flight. But it remained just an idea. The war had ended. 
before it could ever come to fruition. And I don't really think it would ever have worked. That's why I'd nominate that for the weirdest weapon of the lot. In the 1930s, scientists in every major country in the world were looking to see if radio waves could be used as a weapon. One popular idea was to turn radio waves into a death ray. It was already a staple ingredient of science fiction films. The Japanese in particular were keen to develop the weapon. Well, it's interesting the Japanese pursued this technology. It was a, a weapon that was considered science fiction for the time, and only the Japanese really took it seriously enough to have dedicated programs for development of a death ray. But after extensive research, scientists in Japan put the idea on hold. They realized that technology was not yet sufficiently advanced. The bottom line was the power source. They simply could not generate microwaves in sufficient strength at that time for a feasible weapon. While the Japanese had been getting nowhere with death rays, British and US scientists had made a vitally important breakthrough using radio waves, radar. The advantages of radar were obvious. A system that could give advance warning of attacking aircraft on their way would be an invaluable defense. Obvious though it was, not everyone saw the benefits right away. Japanese military leaders, still hankering after some kind of death ray, were more interested in a lethal weapon than radar. Even though the scientists and engineers provided them technology that could be used, the military services did not express much interest in developing radar. The Navy, for example, saw radar largely useful as a navigational aid. When Japan first entered the war in 1941, their forces swept through the Pacific, easily overcoming Allied resistance. They had, they thought, all the weapons they needed. Then, in June 1942, the Japanese suffered their first major setback. When American and Japanese ships went head to head in one of the great sea battles of World War II. Against overwhelming odds, the American Navy won a great victory in what came to be known as the Battle of Midway. The Japanese were stunned from the results of Midway. Many of their prime ships lay at the bottom of the North Pacific, but psychologically, the Japanese Navy has suffered its first major defeat. Desperate, with defeat looming, the Japanese High Command appealed to its scientists and engineers for ideas for new weapons. A brilliant young naval scientist called Ito Yoji had two extraordinary suggestions for Japan's leaders to consider. Either build an atomic bomb or reinvestigate the idea of a death ray. After months and months of research on the atomic bomb, they found it simply wasn't feasible to build a nuclear weapon. So they went with the death ray. Ironically, the success of radar in Britain had led to a technological breakthrough which might now help the Japanese in their pursuit of a death ray. At the outbreak of war, Britain had a coastal radar system called Chain Home. It worked well, but because it used long radio waves, it required radio masts 400 feet high to send and receive the signal. In 1940, two British scientists from the University of Birmingham, Henry Boot and John Randall, invented a device called a cavity magnetron. It could produce much more power in much shorter wavelengths. They were called microwaves. Microwaves are a matter of a fraction of an inch in wavelengths and convey a lot of heat energy into a small space. That's why it is that we all have microwave ovens in our homes. Microwave technology meant that smaller radar transmitters could now be carried on ships and planes. It also had a practical application for Japan's killer ray gun. 
the reason that the invention of the magnetron seemed to bring the death rate closer is that microwaves carry more energy than conventional radio waves do. You can be bombarded with radio waves all day from a certain distance, it's not going to kill you. But you can't be bombarded with microwaves for very long without it damaging. Using microwave technology, the Japanese army built extraordinary death ray prototypes at a new laboratory in Shimada, a hundred miles west of Tokyo. They looked much like a modern day satellite dish. They would send out a strong, highly focused beam of microwaves, which would be fired at a target. What we have is a device that you can point at an invading army and one sweeping stroke fry all the people who are coming at you. Skin melting, eyes melting, people dropping dead. It would, in essence, cook them from within. It would denature their protein. It would heat up their cells so that they could no longer function. Japanese army records show that the first death ray victims were rabbits. As the death rays got more powerful, Japanese records state that they use monkeys as targets. And that has a sinister implication because many times, instead of recording human beings, they would write monkeys. So it's a possibility that the army also used human beings in this research with a death ray. We don't know that for sure, but there's a, a very high probability that they did. But killing animals and possibly humans in controlled conditions was a long way from producing a death ray for the battlefield. What you've got to do is make a weapon that can bring down a person a long way away. And that's very different from just bombarding a sitting duck with microwaves. The Japanese hoped to sight death rays on ships and along the coast to zap invading armies and bring down planes. In tests, they found a death ray could disable moving vehicles by short-circuiting the electrics, but only from a distance of a few yards. So could the Japanese really have fringed the coast with microwave transmitters and stopped anything from coming near? Of course they couldn't. The amount of energy, in theory, you'd need to generate would be all the world's power stations put together. The war ended before the Japanese death ray was ready for battle. As Japanese leaders signed the formal surrender on September 2, 1945, they may well have concluded that if they'd chosen to concentrate their research on the weirdest weapon of them all, the nuclear bomb, then the outcome of World War II may have been very different.